Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you to today's uh, Turnstile Tours virtual program. Uh, my name is Andrew Gustafson. I'll be your host today. Uh, and, you know, we have a special program today uh, about the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We're going to be talking about the, the institution of slavery. Um, it's a really interesting topic. Um, but before we dive in, I just want to welcome everyone and go over a few housekeeping things and, and how these virtual programs work. Uh, I know we have several people who are joining us for the first time. And we have a lot of longtime viewers. Um, and so uh, we welcome everyone to participate, ask questions uh, through the chat. Uh, so helping us out today on the back end, uh, we have Cindy, who's doing the closed captioning you see here. Um, and we also have Stefan, uh, who is our producer. Uh, and so he'll be answering questions and feeding me questions uh, throughout the program. Uh, if you want to turn off the closed captioning or turn them on, you can find that down at the bottom of the screen. You can turn on the closed captioning. Um, but throughout the program, uh, we'll actually keep the closed captions up on the screen uh, through the Google Slides um, that I'm going to be showing. Uh, and so welcome, Howie. Uh, if you want to drop into the chat uh, your name and where you're joining us from, if you have any personal or professional connections to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We always love to hear about that. Um, and again, please feel free to, to uh, share your questions um, throughout the program. Uh, when you do post into the chat, uh, just remember that you can post it to all panelists, in which case just me and Stefan will see it. Um, or you can post to all panelists and attendees and, and everybody uh, who's joining us today will be able to see that. I also want to say hello to the folks who are joining us uh, on Facebook today. Um, so just a little bit about us. Again, if you're new to our programs, uh, Turnstile Tours, we're an organization. We work in partnership uh, with nonprofit and community organizations to help them build capacity to welcome the public. And, and we do that uh, normally through researching, developing, and operating uh, engaging guided tours. Uh, and so we've been working with the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, since 2008 uh, to run the tour program there. Uh, obviously, in the wake of the pandemic, uh, we have not been able to do any guided tours uh, since March 11th. Uh, and so just about a week after that, uh, we decided to dive in feet first with virtual, virtual programs. Uh, and so those, those have been running um, since March 19th. Uh, we've done well over 100 programs now. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue to do them. Uh, we do about three to four programs a week on a variety of different topics with our different partners. Uh, we have a, a great selection of programming related to um, the uh, waterfront in New York City. Uh, we do a lot of work with the street vendors uh, and other food entrepreneurs that we work with through our market tours and our um, food cart tours. Uh, we, we do a lot of programming about New York City parks and, and Prospect Park in particular. Um, so we've sort of taken these virtual programs and uh, piggyback them onto the programs that we do in real life, our guided tours, uh, but we've also expanded uh, well beyond that. And so we're going to continue to do these programs uh, for the foreseeable future, um, and you can help us do that. Uh, so um, some of our programs, we do charge a, a small admission of $5, um, but if you want to join more of the programs, uh, you can become a member. Um, so we just launched our new membership program. It officially goes live tomorrow. Uh, and so we have different levels of membership that you can support us on a monthly basis. And that'll give you access to a certain number of live programs, um, but also recorded programs. And then we're also creating um, special member content, members only newsletter. We're also going to be doing trivia nights, uh, as well as um, happy hours, uh, we'll sort of Q&A with our staff. And we also want to get to know the people who are watching our virtual programs. We try and make this as interactive as we can if we can't all be in the same place together. Um, so we really, really appreciate uh, everybody's in the incredible support that we've gotten. And we want to continue to expand this community um, and share these stories uh, with a wider audience. And, and the membership program uh, helps us do that. At the very end of the show, uh, if you are a member already or a prospective member, uh, I'm going to do a little five-minute workshop to walk you through the new parts of our website and how you can access uh, those, those different benefits. So, so stay tuned to the very end uh, where we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll share some of that uh, information. A um, couple things about uh, programs that we have uh, coming up. Uh, so on Thursday, uh, we're going to be doing a program about Prospect Park. Uh, I am not in Prospect Park right now, but you will get to see more greenery on Thursday. 
Um, Cindy and I are actually uh, currently at my mother's house up in Vermont. We took a few days off to, to head up here, um, get a little bit of fresh air. We, we've been in, in our apartments for the past four months, basically. Um, so on Thursday, we're going to be visiting the Rose Garden, uh, which is one of our favorite uh, parts uh, of, the, um, of the park. Um, then on Sunday, uh, we're going to do a part two of a program we did a little over a month ago uh, with Dennis Riley, who's an archivist at the New York State Archives. Uh, and he's going to do part two of his program uh, about the archives of Puerto Rico um, that are held in New York. And so we're going to specifically look at some of the connections between um, the military and, and the U.S. Navy um, to those archives in, in Puerto Rico. So that'll be a really, really uh, interesting uh, program. Um, and then uh, next week, we're going to do a, a special program um, about a national park that's right here where, where my mother lives up in Vermont, um, the um, Marsh Billings Rockefeller uh, National Park. And then on July 9th, uh, we are doing a special program in partnership with the South Street Seaport Museum, uh, where we're going to uh, look at Bound and Company print shop. Um, so we'll take a little field trip there uh, and learn about the history of that 245-year-old uh, business um, that's keeping a lot of these incredible uh, skills and traditions of letterpress printing uh, alive. Um, so those are some of the things that you have to look forward to. But we're going to dive right into um, to today's topic. Um, a little bit of background about this. Obviously, you know, the Navy Yard is a place that, that our team has worked for the past uh, 12 years. Um, but this particular topic... Uh, is something that actually uh, came to me as a result of, of visitors. Um, we learn so much from our visitors. It's, it's part of the reason why we love giving guided tours. Uh, they're not the same every time because every tour we're learning something. On almost every tour we give, we have someone on that tour who has a personal connection to that place. Um, and so we love to learn from that. And there's so many stories and so much history at the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, that it really, we really depend on visitors to share those stories to help us, you know, find those incredible um, gems uh, in that history and help us find those questions that maybe we haven't asked before. Uh, and so this was several years ago now. Um, we actually uh, were, had a group of um, uh, elementary school students from Brooklyn um, and the students asked, you know, were there slaves here at the Brooklyn Navy Yard? And I didn't really have a good answer. Um, and so this research sort of emerged out of that question. Uh, eventually, I wrote an essay uh, that I submitted for the, the Naval Institute's essay contest. It didn't, didn't win, didn't get published. So I decided to, to publish it on our website um, and, and do this program and, and share the, the research that we've done uh, with all of you. Um, so that's kind of where this, where this emerged from. So if you have questions, um, please feel free to share them with us, either in the chat or follow up with us afterwards. Um, and that, that's really where a lot of this research starts. It's from the questions that our, our visitors ask us. And, and really, the tours help bring people out of the woodwork, people who we may not have encountered otherwise, um, who help us find these incredible stories. Um, so we're going to dive in and um, talk a bit um, First, we're going to talk about kind of the context of the institution of slavery uh, in Brooklyn and Kings County. Um, and we're going to talk about the impact on the Navy Yard specifically, but also look at the impact across um, the Navy more generally. And we're going to focus largely on the period between 1801, which is when the Navy Yard was founded, and 1827, uh, which is when slavery officially ended in the state of New York. Um, but we're actually going to continue on, you know, into, you know, 1861 up to the, the time of the Civil War. Um, and we'll talk about why. Just because slavery ended in New York does not mean that the impacts of the institution of slavery on Brooklyn and on the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, ended, uh, not, not by a long shot. Um, so just uh, bear with me for a moment here while I, while I put my slides. And I'm going to hit the closed captioning button. Okay, so like I said, th these captions that you see down at the bottom of the screen, um, you won't be able to, to turn off um, because they're embedded in the, in the slideshow. Um, but hopefully it's beneficial to, to everybody and it gives our captioner a little bit of a break. Um, okay. All right, so this is a, 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 an artwork that we have used in several programs, and, and it's such an important. Um, piece of art for the history of Brooklyn because it's one of the few images that really captures 
daily life um, in that place uh, in the early 19th century. So uh, for those of you who maybe haven't seen it before, this is Francis Guy's um, painting, A Winter Scene of Brooklyn, part of a series of paintings uh, that he did from his studio on Front Street um, that were debuted in 1820. Um, this is the version of the painting uh, that hangs in the Brooklyn Museum. Um, so, you know, this really uh, highlights a couple of important aspects of, of the story of Brooklyn in this period of time. Number one, um, Brooklyn is still a, a relatively small community. Uh, it is starting to grow with the introduction of, of the ferry, um, ferry service between um, Brooklyn and Manhattan uh, a few years prior, um, but you're still seeing these, you know, small wood frame houses. You have, you know, basically um, small craftspeople. Um, and then beyond the horizon of this painting, it's basically agricultural land um, for the rest of Kings County. The, the population is still very small, but what this also shows is the diversity of the population. Um, and so you can see in the foreground of this image, a number of um, African-American figures. Um, now, most of these figures go unnoted. Um, they were identified by, by a key and most of the, the white people uh, are sort of, um, you know, leading figures of, of the community. Um, but the African-Americans are, are largely um, unrecognized um, with the exception of one, uh, this gentleman uh, back heel here, uh, Samuel Foster, uh, who, who was identified in the key. Um, and he um, actually is a person who um, we believe was likely enslaved um, and became free, but the people that are in the foreground, we really don't have uh, any information uh, about them. Um, and that speaks to something that you may notice uh, throughout this presentation, um, is that we're gonna talk about enslaved people in general. We're not gonna talk about a lot of specific people. And the reason for that is because the records just don't exist. Um, so we know that there were enslaved people that resided at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, we don't know who they were. We know what household they lived in, um, but we don't have much identifying information. And so uh, despite the fact that there was a huge African-American community, you know, in the year 1800, it was about a quarter of the population of Kings County. Um, we know very little about those people. It's really just in, in bits and pieces. Um, whereas most of the white families that were residing here, you know, we could probably do extensive genealogies on, on most of them. Um, so I just wanted to, to note that fact um, that there is a massive silence um, in this story and, and we're continuing to work to, to fill in those silences um, as, as best we can. Um, so I just like to use this as, as a way to, to to kind of set the scene, uh, literally and figuratively, um, for the context of, um, of Brooklyn um, at this period of time. Um, and so we're gonna go back from the time of this painting about two decades to 1800, 1801, which is the context in which the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, is founded and share just some basic facts and figures about the institution of slavery in Brooklyn. So um, Kings County, so again, if, if you're not familiar, if you're not from New York, uh, Kings County and Brooklyn are contiguous. All of the boroughs of New York City are counties. Um, Brooklyn was previously just a, one municipality within the county, but eventually it grew to basically become uh, coterminous with the county. So um, we're not just gonna look at the, the village of Brooklyn, we're gonna look at the whole county here. Um, so its population in 1800 was 5,740 people um, and 26% uh, of those people uh, were, um, were enslaved. Uh, and then you had a small free black population of about 322. Now at this time across the river, uh, New, York, uh, New York City uh, has about 10 times um, the population and a much, much larger free black population uh, actually at this time. Um, so Kings County is still an agricultural community. It's still holding on to its Dutch roots. About half of the population can trace their, pop, trace their lineage uh, back to the Dutch, even though it's been 140 years uh, since, um, since the Dutch uh, left or the, the area was taken over by the English. Um, and so also notable here is that 60% of households own slaves. And then of that remaining 40%, a majority of them um, actually uh, rented enslaved people at some point during the year um, to do largely agricultural work. Um, so this was, a, this was an agrarian community. There are these, um, you know, estates large and small. 
Uh, and so we're not talking about, you know, it's not like the plantation slavery that we imagine of the South where, you know, there's hundreds of people um, that, are, that are enslaved, you know, within a single property. Uh, but it's, um, it's something that basically touched almost every single household um, of, that had properties of, of varying sizes. Um, and so this is really summed up well uh, by the author Craig Stephen Wilder and his wonderful book, A Covenant with Color. Um, and I'll just say at the end of the program, we're going to um, include a, a reading list um, for some books that you can check out on this uh, subject. Um, he, he states that virtually all freeholders, so all white people, um, experienced mastery in some way, whether it was they directly owned slaves or they temporarily rented out their labor um, from, from the master. Uh, so they got to, um, so, um, you know, they were directly involved um, in this um, in, in this institution uh, in some way. So it really touched every aspect of life in, in Brooklyn. Uh, and Kings County was the, had the largest proportion of households that owned slaves of any county in, in New York State. Um, so this was really um, the heart of the institution of slavery um, in, in New York State uh, was, was in Brooklyn. Uh, so what happened to the institution of slavery? So you could say that, you know, 1800, the year we're talking about, slavery is already starting um, to go on its way out. And, and so um, there are two acts um, that lead to the gradual uh, manumission of enslaved people um, in New York State. Uh, you can see the text of both of these here. I know it's probably very difficult to read, um, but we are... Uh, um, we're, 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 I'll, I'll go through kind of the details uh, of these. Um, oh, I, I just wanted to note a question that we had here, uh, which is Melissa asks about the person in the Francis Guy painting uh, who is laying on their back. Um, that's a, that's a, a good question. So it's the person uh, right here. This is pretty typical of art uh, depicting African Americans at the time, uh, which is they are used as an object of comic relief. Uh, so basically it's someone who slipped and fell on the ice um, is, what you see, uh, is what you see in this scene here. Um, and so again, we don't know who the person is, but it's, uh, it, you know, it's meant to be a sort of, sort of comical, comical scene. So you could almost see this as uh, uh, almost sort of like minstrelry uh, here in this image. So that, that's, they're very, a very sharp eye to note that, and, and that's why that's there. Yeah, Melissa says, sorry, she asked. But it's an, it's an important aspect of, of, uh, of the painting. Um, and if, you know, we are limited to the ways in which um, oftentimes African-Americans are depicted by other people because we have so limited accounts of, of African-Americans telling their own story at this time. So it's important to understand the context, uh, context of that as well. Um, okay, so these two acts, uh, so 1799 uh, and 1817. So, so what did these two acts do? So 1799, we have the act for the gradual abolition of slavery. Um, and so what this did was it sort of changed the status of people. Um, so if, you're, um, if you were born to an enslaved mother after July 4th, 1799, um, you became an indentured servant um, if you were a boy until the age of 28, if you were a girl until the age of 25. So this sort of set the clock um, at, uh, um, at uh, 1827 um, for people being freed to, to some degree at least. Um, the other thing that this law did was it basically prohibited the sale or transfer of indentured servants. Um, so you um, could not be you know, sold to, to somebody else once you sort of entered this condition uh, post-1799. Um, you know, this was not the case in other states. So for example, uh, New Jersey abolished slavery a little bit after New York, but in, they had a, also a long period of gradual manumission. Um, and during that interim period, you could sell your slaves. So what a lot of people did uh, was when that clock started ticking, they sold um, those people into slavery in the deep South. Um, so that, that largely did not happen in New York, but it was very, very common in, in New Jersey. Um, so this is followed up by another law um, in 1817, an act relative to slaves and servants. And so 
Uh, this basically applied to people born before July 4th, 1799. Um, and through a variety of means, essentially what it did was um, all people who were born into slavery or bound by this law of indentured servitude, uh, they had to be freed by July 4th, 1827. So that is um, Abolition Day. Although interestingly, it wasn't celebrated until the day after in, in, uh, in New York State um, because it was felt that July 4th was reserved for white people. So, um, you know, free people of, of African descent uh, had to celebrate it on, on July 5th, uh, 1827. Um, that does not mean that the institution of slavery ended in New York. Uh, what it meant is that if you were a resident of New York, living in New York, you could no longer own slaves. However, if you were an out-of-state resident, you could still bring slaves into New York um, for up to nine months at a time. Um, ships that were carrying slaves, they could use the Port of New York, they could resupply here. Um, they just could not um, sell or transfer enslaved people uh, within the bounds of the state of New York. Uh, many of them instead went over, still in New York Harbor, they went over to Perth Amboy, New Jersey, which was a, a major um, slave port for a long, long time. Um, and New York was still bound by the fugitive slave laws. Um, and so New York State was required by federal law to capture, to adjudicate um, the cases and, and return enslaved people to their owners um, in, in, in states where, where slavery was, was illegal. Um, now, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is an interesting example looking at these three sort of um, cases uh, of enslaved people. Um, still being in New York State after 1827 uh, because it's a federal institution. Uh, you have people from all over the country, people coming temporarily. Uh, you have people serving in the Navy who are from the South um, or from states that still allow slavery. And so they are bringing these people in and out of the Navy Yard uh, all the time. And they're bringing these people onto ships, um, ships as well. So even though our time period, we're looking up you know, up until 1827. After 1827, slavery is, is still very much a part of life in Brooklyn, of life in the Navy Yard, and life everywhere in the United States. No corner of the country was untouched uh, by the institution of slavery, as we'll see as we talk about, you know, the production of commodities, um, you know, by, by enslaved labor. Um, and, and really, it just goes to show that, you know, no, no one is free until everyone is free. Um, because again, things like the fugitive slave laws, they applied to every corner uh, of the country. So there was really no safe harbor if you were an enslaved person uh, in the United States. Um, so here we have the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, so again, if uh, you're not familiar with its history, uh, it's founded in 1801. Um, it's one of six federal shipyards that are established um, during this period of time. Um, and so we looked back at the, the records um, of, you know, some of the important figures um, that are connected to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, because again, we, we can't really look at, um, you know, the, the stories of, of enslaved people or African American people of African descent um, here at the yard. We have to look at sort of the prominent white figures um, that we know about and see if we can find any connections. Um, to the institution of slavery. The other major challenge that we face um, is that employment records um, are basically absent prior to 1840 um, for the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, and for a lot of the Federal Navy Yards. Uh, so we don't really have employment figures for that period of time when slavery is, is legal. Um, you know, prior to, to 1827. Um, but if we look back at a couple of the censuses, um, I'll come back to that image in a second. If we look back at a couple of the censuses, we, we do find enslaved people technically living on the property of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and they are within the household of, of officers uh, of the yard. Um, so just as an example, um, these are two very prominent figures in the early days of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. This is Isaac Chauncey on the left. Uh, he was the longest serving uh, commandant of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, really a sort of a, a transformative figure uh, in the history of the yard, um, helped to really um, build it up and, and modernize it after a long period of, of neglect. Um, and then on the right uh, is uh, one of the most famous shipbuilders in American history um, and the constructor 
uh, of the first ship built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, the USS Ohio, um, which was completed in 1820. This is Henry Eckford. Um, and when we look into the households of both of these people, uh, we actually do find that um, in the 1820 census, um, both of them did own slaves um, at, at some point. Um, this is especially disappointing when we look at a figure like Isaac Chauncey, because in many ways he was uh, a champion um, of the rights of, of African Americans. And both of these men um, really made a name for themselves um, on the Great Lakes uh, during the War of 1812. Um, so Henry Eckford oversaw the um, uh, construction of ships in Sackett's Harbor, New York on Lake Ontario. Um, and uh, Isaac Chauncey was the overall commander of the forces uh, on Lake Ontario and, and Lake Erie. Um, so we have this um, mural here uh, by Martel Schuig Lansdorf um, that was painted in, in 2010. Uh, this is actually a mural in Washington, DC, uh, and it's showing um, uh, the Battle of Lake Erie. And so we have a man named Cyrus Tiffany, um, but in the center, we have Oliver Hazard Perry, the, the hero of the Battle uh, of Lake Erie. Now, this was a period of time when African-Americans um, were very, very prominent um, in the Navy. They made up a very, very large proportion um, of the fighting force of the Navy. Um, it was about 10%, uh, it was believed, um, of the sailors um, that were in the Navy were, were actually uh, African uh, American. Um, and interestingly, uh, it was actually Oliver Hazard Perry um, who spoke uh, very poorly um, of, you know, when he took command of his ship that there were so many African Americans um, that were on the, uh, that were, that were part of his crews. And so um, it was actually uh, Isaac Chauncey, um, if I can find the quote here, um, who actually stood up um, in defense um, of those sailors uh, and, you know, really um, noted uh, their incredible bravery. And it was actually this, uh, the accounts uh, of the bravery of African-American sailors fighting in the War of 1812, that was part of the catalyst why in 1817, the state of New York really decided to accelerate uh, the gradual emancipation uh, process, and they passed that that second emancipation law. Um, so Isaac Chauncey stood up for for his sailors, whereas Oliver Hazard Perry was uh, um, was was highly critical of them, um, and and it did have an impact, and it actually had an impact as well on reversing an, an important policy that was in place uh, at the Navy at the time. Um, in 1798, uh, the Secretary of the Navy, a guy named Benjamin Stoddart, uh, he was actually, um, you know, instrumental in founding the Brooklyn Navy Yard. He actually banned um, African Americans from joining the Navy, period. Um, but this was a prohibition that was largely um, ignored. Um, and then, you know, in the War of 1812, because there was such a need for, for manpower, um, that was lifted in 1813. Um, so we did go through a period of time where technically African Americans could not join the Navy, um, but uh, that that was uh, that was eventually um, that was eventually reversed. Um, so, like I said, with these with these people, um, prominent figures in the Navy, we we do see that while they may have made public statements uh, about their support um, of of emancipation and their support of you know African Americans giving being given the opportunity um, to serve their country. They also, uh, if we look at the records, did, did own slaves. Um, uh, and so we also see other officers that, that have slaves um, in, the, in the Navy Yard itself. Um, now, were there actually slaves employed building ships at the Brooklyn Navy Yard? That's a big question. And one that, again, is difficult to answer because we don't have complete employment records. Uh, prior to 1840, we have essentially no employment records. Um, so it's, it's really difficult to say, um, but we can make conjecture um, from other shipyards where we do have, uh, have records uh, and from the general policies uh, of the U.S. Navy, but nothing is going to be definitive what we know about the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So um, officially, um, the Navy actually banned um, the employment of slaves um, at Navy Yards. This was a law, a federal law that was passed in 1817. 
Um, now, why did they do this? Um, the reason for it uh, was really because the Navy Yards were not just founded to build ships and repair ships for the US Navy. They served a secondary purpose, um, largely a political purpose, um, which was for patronage. Uh, this was really, the, the, the Navy Yards were really the largest industrial enterprises that were owned by the public anywhere in the United States. And so what that meant is the jobs at these institutions um, were given out by politicians. They were essentially political uh, appointments. Um, and so these were extremely valuable uh, sources of patronage jobs. And the fact of the matter is, is if the work is being done by enslaved people, those people cannot vote. Uh, so they basically, if you're a politician, they basically can't do anything for you. Um, and so that's why in 1817, um, they, they officially banned the employment of slave labor at, um, at the federal Navy yards. Like the ban on African-Americans serving in the Navy the decade prior, um, this had essentially no effect. It was largely, uh, largely ignored. Um, you could technically uh, apply for a waiver, um, and basically these were granted to anyone uh, for any reason. Um, and in fact, what the federal government ended up doing near these Navy yards, again, probably not in Brooklyn, but as the institution of slavery was on its way out, um, but in other places, they essentially created a market for slave labor, and it encouraged especially officers in the U.S. Navy to purchase slaves so they could then rent them out to the federal government and do labor in these Navy Yards. This was especially prevalent at uh, the Norfolk Navy Yard and the Washington, D.C. Navy Yard. Um, but here we have an example from one of the newly founded Navy Yards. So this was the seventh Navy Yard, uh, which was down in, in Pensacola, Florida. Um, this created a market for slaves in a different way um, because this was largely, um, you know, a, a, a largely um, unsettled area by, by white people. Um, and so it was very, very difficult to get labor, um, sort of what was on the, the very far margins uh, of the United States. Uh, and so what it did was it encouraged the local population to purchase and import slaves so that they could then employ them in, uh, in, into work in the construction uh, of, these, of these Navy Yards. So a lot of this work that's being done uh, is actually construction of the physical plant. So it's building buildings and, and shipways and, and eventually dry docks and things like that. Um, so this was actually an ad that was put out by Samuel Overton, who was um, the Navy purchasing agent um, for the Pensacola Navy Yard. Uh, that, you know, and he would regularly post these, you can find these in the newspaper from this period, um, that they're, they're looking for slaves um, to help build this Navy Yard, despite the fact that, again, employment of slave labor is officially banned by the Navy Department uh, in, in the Navy Yards. Um, so you can see how the federal government is directly implicated in the perpetuation uh, of the institution of slavery um, through, through these uh, Navy Yards. Now, when we talk about enslaved people working uh, in the shipbuilding industry, um, you know, we do see a lot of um, skilled labor um, of, of people, people gaining skills and, and working in this industry. That's also part of the reason why they instituted the ban is that white craftspeople did not want to face competition uh, from, uh, from, from enslaved people. Um, so it wasn't just for the patronage jobs, it was for actually doing the, the skilled work uh, as well. Um, uh, and so, you know, there were cases uh, of a number of, of riots actually at the Norfolk Navy Yard and the Washington Navy Yard, you know, of the, of the white craftspeople, you know, the shipbuilders, you know, trying to drive out um, enslaved people. But this was true as well uh, when we look at the private shipbuilding industry. So the Navy was not just dependent upon the ships that were built. Um, at its own Navy Yards, but also by those that were built um, by, by private industry. Um, and this was an industry that was becoming more and more intertwined uh, with the institution of slavery, especially as uh, more and more enslaved people, you know, learned the skills and the trade because this is, you know, a largely um, very, very skilled, uh, skilled industry. Um, now, I should take a step back here and, and remind people that, you know, African-Americans, um, both free and enslaved, 
um, up to this point had a very, very long history of, of seafaring, of working in the seafaring trade. So that includes both shipbuilding um, as well as you know, working on board ships. Um, and again, enslaved people were employed on ships um, and free black people were. For many people, both free and enslaved, um, the sea offered a modicum of, of freedom. Uh, you were away from the strictures of American society. Um, and in many cases, ships were far more multicultural and obviously everybody was mixed together on board a ship on the close confines. Um, and so uh, you see many people, you know, chose to enter this profession uh, as a way to, to gain that that sort of modicum of freedom. And if we look at this period of time, you know, in the 1830s, it's estimated that, you know, close to 20% of all the seafarers in the Port of New York were, were African American. Um, so this was uh, definitely a, a profession um, that was deeply ingrained um, in, in this community. Uh, and so, you know, I, I show this image here because uh, this represents, you know, probably the most famous uh, African American shipbuilder. Um, and that is Frederick Douglass. Uh, so when Frederick Douglass uh, was uh, enslaved um, in 1829, uh, he was working at a shipyard on this spot uh, in Baltimore. So this is in Fells Point uh, in Baltimore. Um, and so he writes about this uh, in um, his autobiography, um, which was published in, uh, in 1845. Um, and he talks about, you know, working uh, as a, um, working as a uh, caulker, um, so basically caulking ships. Um, and there were more and more enslaved people being employed by these private shipyards, and there was a great deal of resentment um, from the white shipbuilders. And so I'll just read a passage here. Um, I think really illustrates you know, the, the tension um, that, was, that was growing um, within shipyards you know, across the country. It says, and he writes, until a very little while after I went there, white and black ship carpenters worked side by side and no one seemed to see any impropriety in it. All hands seemed to be very well satisfied. Many of the black carpenters were freemen. Things seemed to be going on very well. All at once the white carpenters knocked off and said they would not work with free colored workmen. The reason for this as alleged was that if free colored carpenters were encouraged, they would soon take the trade into their own hands and poor white men would be thrown out of employment. My fellow apprentices very soon began to feel it uh, degrading to them to work with me. They began to put on airs to talk about the N-words taking the country, uh, saying we all ought to be killed and being encouraged by the journeymen. They commenced making my condition as hard as they could by hectoring around me and sometimes uh, striking me. You know, and this resulted in um, basically a riot that almost resulted in, in Frederick Douglass himself being killed um, as just a, a small boy. Um, what's so interesting about this site um, is that where that incident happened, that very shipyard, um, after the Civil War in 1869, a man named Isaac Myers and other skilled um, African-American shipbuilders uh, actually brought the pot property uh, and established uh, their own shipyard, which I believe was the first Black-owned incorporated Corporation uh, in the United States, which is the Chesapeake Marine Railway uh, and Dry Dock Company of Baltimore. And so uh, you can see that here on this lithograph. lithograph. And now that site is preserved, um, telling both of those stories. So both of the, the story of, of Frederick Douglass uh, and his work as a shipbuilder, um, but also uh, Isaac Myers and his cohorts in the creation uh, of, this, uh, of this company. And so many of the buildings are still intact uh, and they still do historic ship uh, restorations. They still have a marine uh, railway. Um, the, that, is, <clears throat> that is operating there. Um, but we can't just talk about, you know, the impacts of, of slavery on the Navy um, just by looking at, at the shipbuilding trade. But basically, if you look at a Navy ship, every part of it, you know, is touched by the labor of enslaved people. Um, so when you're talking about the commodities um, that go into the construction of a ship. So obviously cotton was used all over the country um, for all sorts of different applications, um, including you know, for rope and sails of, um, of, of Navy ships. Um, more and more as we get into the uh, 1840s and 1850s, um, the South is industrializing. And so a lot of the 
um, manufactured goods that go into it, you know, nails, bolts, uh, other parts of, of the ship um, that are made in factories. Those factories are actually uh, being worked by enslaved people. Um, but one of the most important uh, elements uh, of Navy ships that really went to the heart of the power uh, of the U.S. Navy, the quality of the U.S. Navy ships, um, was the lumber. Uh, and specifically, live oak. Um, live oak was an incredibly valuable commodity, um, and it's what gave a ship like this, this is the U.S. Constitution, live oak harvested in the South, harvested by enslaved labor, is the reason why it's called Old Ironsides. Um, this was an incredibly durable wood. It was very hard to find any wood like it anywhere in the world. Uh, and so the Southern live oak um, was an invaluable commodity. And again, it was entirely dependent, uh, the production of it was entirely dependent uh, upon uh, enslaved people. So when you look at a ship like this, you know, built in the late 18th century, you know, you can't look at it uh, without thinking about the labor that went into building it um, and the labor of enslaved people that went into, you know, producing all of the different parts that, that went into that ship. So again, like I said, every corner uh, of the country was implicated in the institution of, of slavery and, and taking, you know, basically a, a manufactured product, you know, like a, like a Navy ship, we can sort of do a, we, you know, what we call a commodity chain analysis of it. Look at all the different parts and, and see where it traces back and, and you'll find that many of, uh, of the lineage of those parts um, actually goes back to the, uh, to the institution of, of slavery. Um, so 1827, um, slavery is uh, officially over in New York State. Um, the U.S. Navy has banned slaves from working in um, Navy yards, but they've also banned slaves from Navy ships. Um, so technically, um, they are not allowed to um, serve on Navy ships and, you know, officers that may own slaves, they cannot bring them onto Navy ships. This, again, was a rule that was completely ignored. Uh, and so through the 1830s, you know, through the 1850s, we see a lot of uh, documents uh, like this one. This was uh, a, sort of a, a memoir, an expose published by a man named William McNally, and it was in which he alleges um, that uh, the mistreatment of African-American, free African-American sailors was widespread, as was um, the practice of officers bringing their, their slaves aboard the ships in violation of, of Navy regulations. Um, you know, this is a really interesting book. You can find it online and we'll share resources for where you can read it. Um, but it, uh, you know, he points specifically to the uh, Coast Guard, what was then called the Revenue Cutter Service, um, where this practice was, was really, really widespread. Um, another interesting document, again, this is the following year in 1840, um, the issue of African-Americans serving in the Navy um, became an issue of the uh, presidential campaign uh, between the incumbent, a New Yorker, uh, Martin Van Buren, uh, and the challenger, William Henry Harrison. Um, Harrison was really trying to appeal to Southerners, uh, so he wrote this, um, this sort of uh, uh, pamphlet uh, called The Northern Man with Southern Principles, and it lays out uh, the positions and the actions of William Henry Harrison um, and Martin Van Buren in regards to African Americans. And this was seen as a, um, uh, basically a, a huge strike against uh, Van Buren, this, this particular case here. And it's interesting too, because 1840 is often regarded as sort of the first modern uh, presidential campaign uh, that used sort of, that used advertising um, in new ways. You know, we have the slogan of, you know, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. Um, and so this was, really a centerpiece of a lot of the uh, campaign literature that um, the, the Harrison campaign put out. Um, and that was that there was an incident um, uh, in which a, uh, in which uh, a ship steward uh, who was African-American uh, alleged um, that he was, he was beaten by a white officer. Um, and essentially uh, there was a court martial and some members of Congress contested this um, and said that the court martial should not be accepting testimony of an African American. They cannot have, even a free person cannot have standing in court to testify against a white person. And Martin Van Buren says, 
I don't see any problem with this. This is fine. This was an outrage to Southerners and, and Harrison kind of jumped on this bandwagon and, and pointed to this as, um, you know, one of the, you know, weaknesses of, and failings of Martin Van Buren is that he would ever even consider um, uh, that a black man could testify uh, against a, a white man. So again, the Navy uh, is really sort of uh, at the center um, of this uh, of this controversy uh, controversy here. And you know, when you think about it, the Navy um, is a microcosm of the country at large. The country is divided, and therefore the Navy is divided. The, the Navy is really just a reflection of the. Um, institutions of the federal government um, and the conflicts uh, within the federal government. Um, and so we're going to talk about some of those conflicts and how they played out specifically at the Navy Yard um, with what should be regarded as something that was ve a, a very noble enterprise, um, but in fact became highly politicized and, and highly complicated. Um, and that is something called the African Squadron. Um, so starting in 18, uh, in 18, 19, um, the Brooklyn Navy Yard became the home um, for the African squadron. And the role of this squadron was to patrol the west coast of Africa um, to interdict the slave trade. Now, slavery was still legal in the United States, um, but the importation of slaves is now illegal. Uh, and so the Navy um, dispatches ships to patrol the west coast of Africa, to patrol the Caribbean, um, to try and stop um, the importation um, of, uh, of slaves and stop this illegal slave trade. Um, now, again, the federal government is, is divided. American public opinion is divided. Um, and so as a result, the, the African squadron is really torn you know, between um, these two factions. Uh, and so as a result, um, it is routinely underfunded uh, and um, driven internally by this factionalization uh, as well. So it was a highly, even though it was around for uh, more than 40 years, it operated from 18, 1819 to 1861, um, but it was really, really ineffectual, um, frankly. Um, and that was really because it was seen as uh, political football. You know, Southern um, politicians did not want to see it um, be used um, be used very effectively, and so it was. Uh, it was essentially um, sabotaged with uh, with lack of funding um, and things like that. Um, and that was really driven by these two individuals. Um, so the person on the left, you see, Abel Parker Upshur. Um, so he was the Secretary of the Navy um, in the uh, 1830s, 1840s. Um, and then on the right, uh, you have uh, John C. Calhoun. Now, both of these are people who would considered to be navalists. What's interesting is that um, obviously most politicians in the South um, were not in favor of strong federal, federal power. Um, they were not in favor um, of, you know, granting a whole lot of authority to the federal government. You know, their motto was states' rights. Um, but actually, these are two individuals who saw that the Navy um, was, uh, is something that could be built up to support the institution of slavery. Um, and the way that they saw it was, was essentially um, the Navy would be protecting slavery in the United States from efforts of Great Britain to you know, abolish, uh, you know, ab abolish slavery and the slave trade um, in, their, in their own colonies. So essentially, um, as British um, abolitionism um, and Britain's own slave patrols are increasing, they felt that um, resources like the Africa Squadron should instead be used to protect American slave ships from intervention uh, by the British. Um, so they wanted to instead turn this instrument of federal power to their own, uh, their own purposes. So again, it really illustrates you know, how the Navy um, is sort of stuck um, in between these, these political factions. But they also saw you know, how basically federal law is that slavery is legal and federal law supersedes state law. So even if states are abolishing slavery, you know, having a federal institution like a Navy Yard there means that, you know, slave owning officers can come and go with enslaved people as they please. And it, it really kept the institution of slavery embedded in the daily life of those communities um, even when that community itself had, had abolished slavery. So it's a very, very complicated story. 
Um, so again, I just want to mention, you know, throughout this, we, we've mentioned only a handful uh, of African Americans, only a handful of, of enslaved people, um, because we, we just don't have the documentation um, that, that we need to tell a, a broader story, especially when we're talking about the period from 1801 to 1827. Um, and so again, that's something that we're continuing to work on. And, and so this is really just, just part one. Uh, we hope that we can uncover more um, and so I wanted to share with you a few resources so you can continue learning about this topic and reading. Um, so these are a handful of, of books that I recommend. We'll also share other resources in our email um, as well as on our website. Um, so a fantastic book. Um, uh, I, I, sorry, I, I forgot to, uh, to put in the, um, the, the full title of this book uh, by Graham Russell Hodges. It's called Root and Branch, uh, African Americans in New York and East Jersey. Uh, 1613 to 1863. Um, I already mentioned before Craig Stephen Wilder's book, A Covenant with Color. Um, Carla Peterson, um, Black Gotham, uh, is a fantastic book, uh, largely looking at a, a later period than we were talking about today. Um, and then um, this is a, an amazing reference book, um, if you're interested in this topic at all, uh, which is The Atlas of the Transatlantic Slave Trade that was put out about five years ago by Yale University Press. And then if you want to look specifically at African Americans in the Navy, um, Jeffrey Bolster's book, uh, Black Jacks, is, is also a, a great thing to look at. So again, like I mentioned, we'll, we'll share some more resources um, in terms of some of the historical documents that we've looked at here. But if you want to look at, um, read some books, um, these are uh, ones that, that I would recommend. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, before we we go, like I said, we're going to take a couple minutes at the end of the program um, to to look at our new membership program. So if you are a current member or you are a prospective member, um, then we would uh, we, you can stick around and, and we'll um, we'll show you how to to navigate uh, the website. Okay, so I'm going to pull my slides down here. So just bear with me for one second. All right, so we're just about out of time. I just want to thank everyone so much uh, for joining us. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed a little bit of scenery uh, that, that's behind me here. Um, and again, th this is a su subject that's, um, you know, obviously of, of great interest, but of great importance too. What, what so many people in America and across the world are doing now is taking a real crit critical look at the silences in our history. Um, and so we're trying to do that, but we have not filled in all of those silences. And unfortunately, because of the nature of this institution and the nature of history, we never will. But we always need to keep trying. Um, and so that's what we tried to do uh, with this program here. Again, if you have any questions and would like to uh, reach out, we would um, you know, be happy to answer uh, answer any questions you have. Uh, if you have any recommendations for other resources uh, we should look at. Um, oh, there is one that I did want to share with folks before we go because uh, it was really in invaluable uh, for this uh, project. Like I mentioned before, we obviously looked at the census. Um, there's only so much uh, you can find in the census, um, but this is a resource from CUNY, um, from, uh, uh, from uh, John Jay. College of Criminal Justice. So I'm just going to share my screen here for a quick second. I can find it here. Um, so this is the New York Slavery Records Index. Um, and so it goes back to the 16th century. Um, and you can search by all sorts of different parameters. So you can search by the year, the household, the address. Um, and you can even search by the name of the enslaved person. Um, so if you are interested in, in doing some genealogy or other historical research um, in New York State specifically, uh, I would highly recommend uh, taking a look at this. So um, again, just to mention real quick uh, some of the programs um, that we have coming up. So on uh, Thursday, it will be our next program, July 2nd, we are gonna be visiting the Prospect Park Rose Garden. Um, then on Sunday, uh, we are looking at um, Puerto Rican history um, and connections to the U.S. military with uh, Dennis Riley. Um, then the following Tuesday, we haven't posted this yet, but we will later today, 
Uh, we're going to do a program about uh, the history of conservationism um, and the Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Park uh, here in Vermont. Uh, and then uh, next Thursday, uh, July 9th, uh, we have a special program with our friends at the South Street Seaport Museum, uh, where we're going to look at uh, Bound and Company and letterpress printing in the 19th century. So those are some of the things uh, you have to look forward to. So I want to thank everybody so much uh, for joining us. Uh, I want to encourage you, please tell your friends and your family about these programs. Um, thank you for joining us, if you did, on, on Facebook. Um, and please consider becoming a member. Uh, you know, we want to continue doing these programs for as long as we can. Um, and we don't know when we're going to be able to come back to begin giving live in-person tours. But if you become a member, you can help support us. We have some great benefits. And we're going to extend those benefits to programs that we do in real life, in the real world, when we're back to giving guided tours sometime in the future. So um, there's, uh, we have so many more stories to share. Um, and we can't do it without your support. So, so thank you all so much. Um, so I'm going to let folks uh, who um, want to uh, need to sign off uh, at the hour mark sign off. But if you want to stick around, again, if you're a member or a prospective member, I'm going to do a quick two-minute introduction uh, to how our, um, how our new membership uh, system works. Okay, so... Um, and again, please feel free to drop in questions if you have any, if you're confused about anything. Uh, and you can always reach out to us, uh, of course. So I'm just going to pull up our new uh, web page here. OK, so if you are a member, um, you receive a welcome, uh, a welcome email. Um, and um, you also will receive a, receive a password reset. I know some people have had some trouble with that. It doesn't always work, but you can always come to this page. So you go to turnstiletours.com slash, uh, slash login. Um, and here you just enter your username. Uh, your username is your email, the email you used to sign up with, um, and then your password. So again, if you didn't get a password reset link or you forgot your password, just click forgot password and I'll send you a link to your email to, to reset it. So I'm just gonna sign in here with my account. Um, and here, this should have all of the details um, about your account. So it'll show your membership level. We'll talk about the membership levels in just a second. Um, and it'll also show uh, the expiration date um, for that. Uh, so you can sign up for a one month or a six month membership um, and it is a, a rolling membership. So you might see an expiration date that's one month from when you started, but um, you signed up for a recurring payment. Um, when that recurring payment is processed, it will update it to the next month and the next month. Um, and so to see all of that information, um, you just scroll down here and you can see the um, subscriptions. Um, so you can see what you're signed up for um, and how long it's going uh, to um, be good for. So you can see I signed up for a subscription, a quartermaster subscription, um, and that'll run for six months. I just did this as a sample. Um, and you can also see the payments here. Um, so again, I did this as a sample, so there aren't any payments here. Um, but you will see if you pay by your credit card, you'll see that credit card payment. You'll see when the next payment is going to be um, is going to be processed and you can also cancel at any time. So you can just hit the cancel button uh, at, at any time. So we try and make it as easy as possible. Now let's say you want to upgrade or downgrade your membership. Um, you just have to cancel your existing subscription and then go to the membership page and you can, um, you can sign up. Um, so the one other thing I wanted to mention here uh, was how do you sign up for programs? Now, if you have a quartermaster level uh, subscription, um, what you're going to see here starting tomorrow, because we're officially launching this tomorrow, um, is a calendar. Uh, and from that calendar, you can actually sign up for programs. You don't have to sign up for programs. You can just sign in directly to them through Zoom. So essentially, uh, what we share with you, um, if you have our, uh, have our quartermaster uh, membership, um, is, the, um, is the Zoom link directly. So you can just go straight into Zoom uh, and uh, you'll have a password there. And so you can just sign in directly. Um, and if 
obviously not everyone is going to come on this web page, you know, a couple times a day to see what's coming up. Um, there's also a link where you can just click to add, add that to your, uh, your calendar. So you'll get a reminder in your calendar. Um, now, this is a Quartermaster uh, subscription. Um, so this is the, the top level subscription. Um, now, if you have the apprentice or the steward level subscription, um, this is what you want to pay attention to because um, this is essentially you're, like you had an all access pass um, uh, code. This is your code, your member ID. So when you log in um, or when you go, excuse me, when you go um, you know, to sign up for a program on our website, so you can go to our calendar. takes a second to load here. Oh, sorry, I'm already logged into Fair Harbor. But anyway, when you go to our calendar to log in, just like you would with the All Access Pass, um, instead of putting um, your FH code, you have this new TT code um, that you're gonna put in there. So you just use that um, whenever you wanna sign up for a program. So for the Quartermaster um, membership, one of the perks that we give is, is you don't need to sign up and put your name and email and other information down every time you wanna sign up for a program. You can just go straight into the Zoom. Um, for the apprentice and the steward level membership, um, you just have to use this ID and, and sign up through Fair Harbor, just like you were doing now. And, and again, if you ever forget this number, <coughs> excuse me, you can always just um, log in um, at this membership tab right here. So last thing I just wanted to mention was the different membership levels. Uh, and again, we're gonna be updating the benefits and adding more things to the, these as time goes on. So our First level membership is called the Apprentice, so that's $5 a month. So that allows you to use that membership ID to sign up for two uh, live virtual programs per month. Um, you get access to our monthly newsletter that we'll be launching in a couple of weeks. Um, and we'll also be doing our live um, virtual happy hour um, every month. Um, the steward level, you get access to four live paid programs. Um, and you also get a discount on in-person tours when they resume. Uh, and then the quartermaster level, you get access to all the programs. You also get access to the full archive. Oh, I should say with the story level, um, we have a, a limited number of recorded programs that you can have access to. And so uh, we'll be rotating those every month. Um, so over time, you'll eventually be able to see everything. We just don't make it all available all at once. Um, with the quartermaster, you get access to the full archive of over 100 programs. You can watch all the programs you want and you don't need to sign in. You can just come directly uh, into Zoom. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, a question that some people had. Um, someone mentioned that, you know, we, for many people who sign up for our All Access Pass, uh, maybe later on in the season, um, we decided to extend that because it was a flat rate for an indeterminate period of time. Um, so if you signed up in May or June, um, we definitely extended your membership further on um, at no charge to you. Uh, and so uh, someone asked that, um, you know, if they got a free donation, can they still continue to make a donation? Yes, you can actually sign up for multiple subscriptions at once. You just can't sign up for the exact same subscription. So if you already are enrolled, say in the Quartermaster, you can add a steward level subscription. Now you don't get anything in addition, but if you do want to make a recurring donation, uh, you're welcome to do that. And the other thing as well uh, is that um, for any of the programs that you sign up for um, through Fair Harbor, through our ticketing platform, we do always have an option to uh, add a gratuity. So we always appreciate that. Um, and I just want to say, you know, everybody throughout this entire process has been so generous. Um, and we, we so appreciate that. We, we would have had to stop doing this long, long time ago if it wasn't for a really de dedicated following. But I'll also say that... Um, you're, this, I'm our entire IT team, <laughs> so I've been kind of bootstrapping this and building this as best I can. So I just want to apologize in advance that, um, you know, not everything always works super smoothly and perfectly, but we try and be on top of things as best we can um, and make this, um, you know, something that's accessible to people and, and relatively easy to use with the limitations that we have. Um, and, and, you know, our, our number one goal is to provide good good content and, and engagement um, with you folks. And so again, we, we really couldn't do it without you. So I just wanna say, say thank you to, to, to everyone. And if you have suggestions, if you have 
you know, improvements. If you have any trouble, do not hesitate to reach out to us. We, we try our best to, to stay in communication with everyone uh, and, and help everyone have the best experiences that they, um, that they can. So um, that, that's about it. I wanna thank everyone uh, so much for, for joining us today. This is a, a subject that's near and dear to, to my heart and it seemed especially topical um, in the current climate. So thank you everyone uh, so much for listening um, and we will see you on Thursday. All right, have a great day.